broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America, bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Ben Crossman, and I hope you all are doing great because we have a great show planned for you. Where in the second part of the program, as usual, we will be doing computer and technology news. And we have a lot of articles. I don't think we're going to be able to get to all of them, but we're definitely going to update you on net neutrality and uh, the recent vote that happened just today, just a couple of hours ago. And, uh, you know, hey, spoilers, uh, a small victory. There's still a lot more legal wise that has to happen for net neutrality to, uh, you know, kind of continue to be what it is but uh but hey progress in the right direction hey i can't tell that we're biased in a certain direction but there you go uh so there's that and then there's many many more including maybe rumors of a new apple uh headquarters coming to the united states and i think someone made a drone out of pizza so you know all important things so with, uh, with that being said, let's go ahead and uh, get to a couple things. Oh, and by the way, in the first segment, uh, in just a minute, we're going to introduce our guest, who is a company called AI Certain, and there's a lot to unpack there. I'm really looking forward to our conversation, uh, especially as it relates to, of course, artificial intelligence, as well as, uh, well, kind of sports betting. It's, uh, hey, it's going to be a lot of fun. So, uh, but a couple of things, including computeramerica.com, that's where you'll find everything from a link to our guest website, to any articles, videos that we show, anything like that. And also be sure to check out uh, the social media contest brought to you by, uh, by the way, everything brought to you by OWC and Logitech. Thank you so much to our sponsors. So, uh, why don't we go ahead and just introduce our guest? So, our guest today, as I said, AI certain, and obviously we're going to be discussing artificial intelligence at length. And I can think of no one better to help us do that than the CEO of the company, Mr. Tim Kenny. So, Tim, welcome onto Computer America. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, thanks for the invite, and I'm glad I didn't have to follow an autonomous pizza. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure we're as interesting as that. <laughs> yeah, I, no, it's uh, that's a tough story to follow. We're we're gonna cover that one last, and uh, but AI is its own subject where I think if if not people are interested in you know kind of AI itself and not just the Hollywood sense of you know iRobot kind of deal. But AI in the sense of what it can do for us, I hate to get high level here, but as a society, as, you know, as a race, what AI can do for all of us, it's, uh, it, it's pretty exciting times. And it's, you know, happy to have you guys on to, uh, you know, really have a, a, an in-depth knowledge of this. And, you know, we're not going to get into the extreme nitty gritty, but hey, uh, what you have shown possible already and i know that there's some announcements that you uh that you've made recently and we'll get into that but uh let's take a step back here let's start from the beginning uh give us an overview of ai certain and give us an overview of tim kenny i mean how did you find yourself working in this new field sure uh, I started AI Certain uh, doing the research on it about two years ago. I thought I was retired from uh, one of my last uh, CTO gigs um, at a company called uh, My Web Grocer, and before that, I was with uh, G Healthcare and ro uh, ran uh, global research and development in their imaging healthcare uh, IT area. Um, so I've got quite a quite a background in healthcare too, um, but. Uh, I, my background going way back goes all the way to uh, back into the late 80s and early 90s in grad school uh, in AI. Um, and back then, neural nets were a, a toy that people were playing with and not 
where most of the research was going on. It always fascinated me. And when I uh, thought I was retired, I started to tinker with it. And my son uh, joined me. And uh, before we knew it, we had stumbled into uh, figuring out some really complex problems um, using neural nets in a way that we don't think anybody else has been able to do. And that's solving uh, intractable problems, problems that have no existing efficient algorithm to solve them, um, where the combinations are really high uh, and and the data is massive. So we, we recently filed a patent on that and we went looking for an area where we could purchase some data inexpensively and make a bang with uh, some accurate pred predictions and we happened to pick uh, horse racing for that. Yeah, and to uh, you know to make to make such a splash, that's how actually I found out about you guys was uh, was a press release saying that you know where uh, there's it, it you're able to adapt your artificial intelligence to give you an accurate prediction, and you did so accurately. That's the great part of accurate predictions is when they're right. Uh, so let's go ahead and get into, obviously, uh, we have a link to your website, which is currently AIHorseRacing.com. Uh, lots of announcements. You can you know, mention those as well. But uh, talk about your foray into kind of horse racing. First of all, why? And second of all, uh, great timing because you made a lot of predictions around, uh, you know, the, the, the Kentucky Derby. Sure. Um well, we, we both, uh, in the summers when my son was uh, younger, we liked to, my daughter rode horses and we liked to go to uh, Saratoga and watch the races. Um, I wouldn't say we're big uh, wager placers, but we, d we did like to go watch the horse races. Um, and when we uh, took a look at uh, different sport areas. We thought sports might be a good one to get into to start with this because the data is accessible. It's a lot harder to get healthcare data as an example. We can talk about that later. But um, we said, yeah, we could get we could get the horse racing data, and then do this analysis. And the the complexity here of of the data that's involved even in horse racing is really quite intense. So um, if you think about like the Kentucky Derby itself where 20 horses are running, there's 2.4 times 10 to the 18th possible finishing combinations in that race. Um, and then you look at the data that you're able to to get across those horses. And it's things, um, if you're not a horse person, I'll, I'll use some, I'll keep the terms sure. simpler, but um, there, there are things like uh, the weight of the jockey and is the horse uh, on any medication changes and how fast did it run in its last race? And um, is there extra weight it's been, that it has to carry in this race? Uh, what's its pace style? Um, and. And we look at these things as dimensional data. So to us, that's a very simple dimensional data, but it gets really complex fast when you say, this horse has ran in 25 different races and you have the data for all of those races, all of the horses, all of the jockeys, all of the trainers and owners. Um, and um, in horse racing, it happens to be their lineage is important. So the, the sire and the dam, the uh, father and mother of the horse are important too. And you look at all their data mm -hmm. and the experts in horse racing combine all of this and learn over their lifetime how to predict that with the weather um, and uh, and um, workout schedules that have happened recently. Did they give the horse enough time off? And that's how they go about predicting a race and trying to come up with probabilities of who's going to win. Um, we took that same approach, but with way more data than a human mind can input into it um, so that we were able to combine all that a variable multi-dimensional data is how we look at problems like this um, into one data set that we could train a neural net with. So um, neural net technology, of course, is um, uh, something that's uh, really driving some of this latest AI push. Um, and, and we use that technology to train a neural net over tens of thousands of prior races with, with real world data so that when, and that, that process takes a lot of computational power and time, but the actual prediction only takes seconds. It's really fascinating. You jam all the multidimensional data in, and in a couple of seconds, the computer kicks out and says, here's the probabilities of all the different horses finishing. 
Right. So, I, and I mean, if uh, anyone out there has watched the video, I'm, I'm grinning like an idiot because we have heard of this kind of thing for uh, cancer research purposes where doctor, you know, doctors feed, uh, uh, Watson is one of the most, uh, well-known ones and they feed tons of data, ten, tons of case studies, tons of, uh, photos and images. And, you know, it's, uh, where it's kind of a game of chance, but you know, cancer is not really a game, but being accurate there is kind of life-saving whereas being accurate with horse racing not saying you know that you have to strictly compare one to the other but you get into uh, let's face it a uh let's see horse racing used to kind of be like gambling used to be a game of chance used to be uh something that you could say well you know i i feel like with everything i know this is what i think will happen and I know that you're doing that within a computer, but talk to how accurate you're getting and if that really still makes these things, you know, a thing of chance. Because while things such as, you know, the horse tripping or, you know, or something catastrophic like that can still happen, uh, how accurate were you able to get? And, you know, in, in the near future or even now, how much of a chance are you really taking if you follow, you know, your AI? So, so the the interesting thing that we found in in this area was that um, there is a statistical upper limit on the accuracy that you can get to with like predicting a winner. Um, so uh, you you might be able to get into the low forty percent of your your top pick being the actual winner. So what the AI actually does though is is far more than just say here's who I think is going to come in first, second, and third. It actually computes probabilities. Um, down that are accurate to within a half a percent. So when it tells us that a horse is going to finish, um, that it has a 30% chance at coming in first and the next horse has a 22% chance at coming in next, um, we're very certain that 30 times out, if you ran the same race 100 times or you go back through the tens of thousands of examples, you'll find that 30 times out of 100, this horse will win. Mm -hmm. And because uh, horse racing happens to be paramutual betting where you're betting against other people, um, you can look for odds that are in your favor. Um, it, so it, it doesn't destroy the sport with you, you know for certain what's going to happen. So if we applied this and, and we plan to to other professional sports or college sports, um, You'll, you'll be able to rely on the statistical probabilities of this is the score range of the game and this is who we think is going to win. But if it comes out and it says it's 55% uh, this one and 45 someone else, um, you still have 45 times out of 100 that it's going to go in the other direction. It's just if you're betting over longer pools, then, then you have a distinct advantage. So, and I guess that's where I get tripped up is because uh, I, I guess I just read the articles and they may be sensationalized a bit where, you know, something like AI certain would be like, hey, we picked uh, so-and-so to win or so-and-so, but I guess that means so-and-so is the favorite to win. And, you know, while someone may come out ahead, it may be just a, you know, a slimmer chance, but it wasn't, you know, uh, a complete uh, long shot. It was just, you know, once more likely to, that doesn't guarantee, right? That That's right. Um, I think what, what we showed with the technology that we have is that unlike the, um, uh, I don't think anybody else, at least I haven't heard of anybody else who picked the top two that we did, um, especially number one, they did that, that was the favorite. The number two horse was not in the favorites list um, at the time of the start of the race. So I do think the AI did a good job at finding this horse out of the pack and saying, given the way this big group of horses is going to run, and all the data that it can look at, um, this is the one that will come in uh, second. And and you're right that it's still a statistical probability um, could go a different way, um, but that that's part of why I think people are still wagering in these areas. If it was guaranteed, wagering would stop. Right. So let's talk about how what you've done with you know with your AI compared to earlier ones because. I think, uh, you know, just uh, again to a different uh, to a different kind of race, but, you know, uh, maybe even equally important. Uh, I think Google has an AI that they use to predict the uh, 
to predict the presidential elections every election cycle. And, you know, that one's been correct for a while, but, uh, and there are, like I said, many other AIs out there that are predicting different outcomes with lots of data sets, but they change. You mentioned that you have a different method that you are looking to patent. Uh, how, you know, how, how is your AI compared to something, let's say something similar, like the, uh, you know, like the AI that predicted the Derby in 2016? How, sure. what have you done? Um, so, so a lot of these other AIs are using a, a, a type of, uh, they are using neural nets, but they're using something called swarm technology. And the best way to visualize that is if you've ever seen schools of fish swim in the ocean, um, they, they act as almost like one organism. And there is intelligence in that. They're all interacting with each other. Um, bees do that too. Um, so the swarm technologies take into account all of the human predictions that have been done um, on uh, in or that that are being forecast for an area, mm -hmm. and they com they compute um, using the neural nets. It figures out um, how that moves around the data over many thousands of examples. So it's more than a fancy averaging. Um, it, it, it is really actually using uh, deep learning neural networks to do a training. Um, what, what we found in, in our technology, because we're able to consume, we think, much larger data sets than some of the other methodologies, we found that we're able to, um, we're able to actually keep that information out of the system, makes it more accurate. Um, we found if we take one of those data elements from an expert and we put it into the um, system, it's almost like the AI is lazy in its early learning <laughs> stages. It, it says, it says, hey, that, that looks pretty good. Let's weight that very heavily. And it never unlearns it the way it should. And so by removing all of the human elements and just saying all these humans are using all this raw data um, and, and they don't, you have so many billions of neurons in your head as an expert that's been looking at a problem area for years, you can't even articulate why you think something's gonna change just a little bit in this case. Um, the AI in many ways learns that exact same pattern um, and, and can come to conclusions, except that um, I think the, the difference is with, and why AI will be more accurate than experts in many areas in, in the future mm -hmm. is the breadth of what that reach can be um, and of the data. So a human mind can't take into account, I think what we're looking at in, in a race like that, um, we had access to uh, 1,500 uh, plus data elements, because I said it's variable, it depends on how many prior races a horse had run, um, 1,500 variable data elements per horse per race and then all that going backwards in terms of training um, that's an awful lot for a person to look at we we would learn the problem in a simpler method and say well first i'll look at speed and you'd say oh that gets pretty close and then you'd add another data element and we're kind of a little bit more algorithmic about how we learn it until we've seen enough examples and then we can't explain anymore why we feel something's going to happen um, but the ai doesn't doesn't start up that way. It starts by looking at the super large data set and then using what's called back propagation to do the training. So it, it ends up at a more stable place, I think, faster and, and more accurate than you can do with a person. Yeah. And I, I, I guess because you mentioned that problem with people where, or at least with AIs, where it may weight something more heavily, you know, earlier into the program that it kind of uh, you know, discover something or, you know, or trends a certain way. I think people are the same way. It's called bias. And, uh, you know, a lot of people are susceptible to it as well. One problem with AI that we've heard in the past is that when you want to train an AI from one task to another, and this may be a problem for, uh, you know, for your AI, because, you know, horse racing is one thing and lots of data sets. And while, you know, an AI may learn to, uh, you know, how how the weather may affect an outcome just as much as it would between horse racing or football, or how, uh, you know, the time between, I don't know, training sessions between one group of athletes to another group of athletes. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of bits of information that just don't apply. I don't think that you really need to uh, know the sire of a football player to, you know, understand the outcome of a of a I'm sorry, of a football game. Uh, when you're talking about 
using your AI for different uh, tasks or even the same task with different data sets, uh, it, do you still have to run into that problem where you wipe the slate clean, wipe the AI completely, and it has to relearn everything all over again? Or is or are you coming to uh, understand the problem of kind of making these things adapt to different situations? Yeah, I, I think you're hitting on an area that neural nets uh, that that's frequently uh, misunderstood by some people in terms of what n neural net technology can do. Um, it It's not and ours isn't maybe someone else is working on something. It's not a generic purpose mind that you trained in one thing and then you can show it something new and say, now learn this. Right. Um, they're, they're very specific implementations. So take, for example, healthcare, another area that we're uh, strongly looking at applying this technology. Um, we, we think we can solve some problems other people haven't been able to because we can take in all of your past x-rays, CAT scans, MRIs, ultrasounds, symptoms, um, medical history tests into one giant data set to help you do diagnostics. And that's very different than, um, for example, the people that uh, the cancer stuff you were talking about, where they highlight on the screen for a doctor and say, I think I see an area that has cancer in it on an image. Um, well, when a doctor looks at that image, he he's looking at the image, but he knows in the back of his mind because he's already reviewed the chart. A radiologist who's looking at the problem says, um, "I I've already um, I've already looked, and I know this person comes from a certain area where they're prone um, to these type of cancers. He's a smoker. You know, they they've got this in their head already as they're making their diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And the machine ones, most of them that are out there today, they can't take in that other data. They take in the image, they analyze it. They take in the other data, they analyze it, and then they try to combine it late in the game. And I, and I think what's new about what we did is we combine it all in one step in the AI. But it, it doesn't mean I could even take that one and show it the next problem like baseball and say, here's a whole bunch of baseball stats. <laughs> um, you, you have to set the problem up and then find, and this is another thing that's different about AI than humans. Um, you know, humans go to med school for four years and then become a resident. Um, uh, the, the AI needs these very specific training sets set up with tens and tens of thousands of examples, more than a person needs in order to train it. So a person can read some books, learn some generic stuff, um, see, I don't know how many hundred cases they might see in their, in their rotations or whatever, but not tens of thousands. And in order to train AI, that's one big limitation still is you need tens of thousands of training sets. So you think that for now, uh, it's a great tool and it augments, it doesn't replace, at least at the moment it doesn't replace, but it augments and helps to do that kind of thing, right? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, I think it'll it'll be uh, fun for people and help them with making their own decisions. Um, and I think this in AI in general, um, uh, but I, and, but I do think when you train it into specific areas, it can get better at a single task than a, than a human might be able to. But it doesn't mean it's generically better at everything than a human. It's just your AI happens to be able to um, detect one certain thing with high accuracy better than a person might be able to. Right. And, and then, of course, that's – but, hey, we can blame uh, science fiction for that. When they say AI, they think, wow, that AI is really good at that one thing. So imagine if it did another thing or everything just as well. Uh, we're not quite there yet. But, uh, but, but I will ask you, because uh, there was a recent uh, court ruling from the Supreme Court that – made sports betting legal in the United States. And of course, it's going to be a state by state thing and how they implement it. But I did that article yesterday to kind of warn people that sports betting, especially within apps and technology and online and things like that, uh, it it's about to explode. It's about to go boom like we haven't seen in a while because a lot of people like to bet and the floodgates are open. Um, how, when it comes to sports betting, uh, obviously this is where your AI is, uh, you know, kind of leaning towards with horses. And then, like you mentioned, you wanted to bring it into uh, collegiate space and you know other sports. Uh, do you think that AI helps the average person that can kind of you know 
you know, use a tool that you design and go, who's going to win on Wednesday? And on and it spits out an answer and they blindly go bet. And, you know, you make everyone bankrupt because you never give a wrong answer. Or do you think you help, you know, maybe the other side, the people who make the odds and say, uh, you know, we're only going to give 1.1 1. 1, uh, winning you know, ratio because uh, odds are this is right. I, I mean, how, how does AI and betting kind of work into each other? Yeah, uh, that's interesting. Um, I think our vision has been that um, we'd like to empower um, the, the, the masses against the people who have big statistical algorithms that are running at the last minute. Um, because that's what goes on in horse racing today. There, there's a lot of algorithmic betting that comes in late in the in the betting cycle. Um, and it's hard for you as an individual to compete with that. And in, as sports betting becomes uh, more prolific, I think we'll we'll see some of that same thing. But if but if you have the capability to go online and find a system that uh, gives you fair odds and and that's what we are trademarking for the term that we're using is we're trying to give you a fair look at what the odds are so you know how risky your wager might be. Um, it's obviously always risky. Um, and and uh, I hope people look at uh, gambling and sports as entertainment and don't try to make a living off of it. I think it's a, it's a hard path. Um, but uh, I do think the AI can help them make smarter decisions before they go place a risky bet. The the human uh, psyche, I think, loves long shot odds. There's no nothing more fun than going to the track, putting a dollar bet down, and walking away with eighty bucks. Right. Um, you're, you're like, that was great, <laughs> um, but it doesn't happen very often. And if you can see that, and you can read a little bit of statistics, uh, just percentages, and say it only had a four percent chance. So am I am I lucky or was I? Well, not lucky. Um, and I think it would help people if they can see some of that data. Right. So, uh, or no, and I guess that does make sense because, again, it's not a sure thing. It's just, you know, kind of over the course of 100 attempts. Uh, and I'm actually also curious because these data sets, we've heard of other AIs. I'm thinking right now of, of, of Google's uh, AlphaGo which was a, an artificial intelligence that was trained to play the game called Go, and it did very well. It, uh, and one way that I heard it trained itself was that it would make a copy of itself and yes. then it would play <laughs> against itself over and over and over again. And, and you know, I'm kind of curious if your AI does something similar. While I don't think it wastes time making, uh, you know, complete videos that show a horse race, in you know in you know kind of in real time as it's thinking about the odds could something like that be possible because you know do, does the simulation or um, well actually that's the word does it simulate every single race or does it just kind of you know buy the numbers and big excel sheet uh you know kind of simulate them numerically no you're, you're touching on something i'll be careful how i answer um uh, you, you're correct in that um, it does generate extra races for itself for training. So while we may have 15,000 or 20,000 actual races, we train on far more than that. Um, and we found a way to do that. Um, it's not like it's racing itself, but it's it's running races where the outcome is pretty certain to help with the training. But also even in the, um, in the prediction phase, we've found that um, – that that it's helpful to run the race in different ways so we do actually generate um uh some different race parameters to see what the likelihood of some of those changes might be and let the ai do that and then we average that at the end so uh, it's not it's not quite the same as playing itself because it's not going to race itself mm -hmm. but you're right that it's it's something that a human mind would do too if you, if you were looking at an event um let's take uh, pro football which i happen to like to watch and you said uh what happens if the quarterback gets hurt in the third period and he's out can they still win um that might be a scenario you'd run in your head um we run some of those with the ai too okay so you throw in some a uh, bit of randomness in there and uh it, i guess it does help with the overall uh end result so and this is of course a very interesting you know kind of way because i, I was i was thinking if you could put a graphical side to this I mean, horses are great. Uh, I believe that they're big, very big money, and I've seen, I've heard some numbers 
uh, just for even, you know, kind of getting one of these thoroughbred horses. It's the amount of money that people put into horse racing and the like. Uh, I could imagine that realistic, theoretical, possible simulations, if you put a graphical uh, spin to it, people could, you know, kind of enjoy that as well. But hey, uh, Tim, uh, uh, would you mind staying over? Uh, we're about to head off to break. Would you mind staying over? No, that's fine. Right, perfect. So everyone, uh, we'll be right back. More Computer America, more AI Certain, and more Tim Kenny right after this. Everyone, stay tuned. Greece is cheap. But the airfare costs a fortune. Paris? Not much closer. And again, airfare. What about Puerto Vallarta? Let's face it, flying anywhere is just too expensive. Wait, what's this? low-cost airlines with one call to low-cost airlines you'll drastically slash your travel costs we're talking insanely low airline prices to any of your favorite destinations where would you like to go london rome costa rica australia wow that's cheap so why wait call now to learn how crazy cheap it is to fly anywhere in the u.s or international our prices are so low we can't publish them the only way to get them is to call to instantly hear the most amazing best deals on airlines travel. It's that easy. So call now and start packing. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. That's 800-215-4461. We are all Brother Wolf. Ten years ago, a group of locals banded together to create positive change. We took animals into our homes, held adoption events at local retailers, and talked to the community about our mission to help build a no-kill Asheville. A decade later, we have achieved so many victories for animals in need. There's been so much progress, yet there's still so much to do. As part of our year-long celebration, we encourage you to become a member of our special Compassionate Circle program. With a monthly donation of $10 or more, you will have behind-the-scenes access to the work we are doing at Brother Wolf. Our goal is to reach 1,000 members because we receive no government funding. Working together, we can help build and sustain no-kill communities. Learn more at CompassionateCircle.BWAR.org. We are a 501c3 tax-deductible organization. And welcome back to the Computer America Show. It is 32 minutes past the hour as we continue on here. And yeah, we are talking to Mr. Tim Kenny. He is the CEO of AI Certain. And obviously, uh, a lot of this is circling around uh, horse racing. But uh, as you mentioned, that you are looking to expand this into a lot of different fields. And the point that I was trying to make earlier that uh, before the break was that uh, some of those simulations that you are strictly using for training purposes, it, do you see a future where, you know, raising these horses, it's a million upon million upon million dollar uh, industry. And let's face it, getting everyone to travel, getting everyone there, um, it's, you know, maybe for everyday kind of uh, in entertainment or betting or as like a lowest common denominator, do you foresee something like your AI able to uh, create these events where, you know, it doesn't happen in real life, but it's as good as if it did and you could probably bet on it? Oh, I think that the, I th certainly the AI, AI systems could do that. Um, I, I think the issue would be the the having to prove that you're not gaming the system would be very difficult in a virtual world like that. Um, but I think in some ways we're seeing some of that today with uh, um, the the gaming streamers that that we're witnessing. Right. And uh, I mean, that's uh, although those are real people on the other end, it's a virtual world that they're competing in. Um, so I could see a future where maybe people are pitting different AIs against each other. The issue I think you'd have today is that it's one person's AI, which means you could fix it. Um, but if it was definitely different AIs, I, th I think that's a that's a good science fiction book right there. Um, <laughs> I, no, it, it absolutely does, and we've uh, we've definitely seen esports, and right now it's a lot of fun to watch uh, individuals play against each other, but. Even in some of the more, uh, you know, e uh, 
because Go, you know, board, board games like chess and Go are one thing. Uh, I believe there's AI training in games like StarCraft, which is a real-time strategy. But then you have, uh, you know, beyond that, different genres. It's, uh, you know, right now, I think humans have the edge on robots in a lot of respects. But, uh, hey, we're quickly heading to a future where that won't be the case. So let's talk about AI certain and uh, and. As I understand it, you're giving something away for free in regards to, are you giving away the source code? Are you giving away uh, the odds for you know the races that you were tracking? I mean, what, uh, how, how do everyday people or how do institutions, uh, you know, kind of benefit from what you're doing here? Right. Well, we were giving away um, the odds for free during the. Uh, pilot process to prove the technology. Um, we really wanted to attract someone, uh, one of the larger companies in, in horse racing to license the technology because we think we have uh, at least 10% uh, better uh, pick accuracy than, than any of the other technologies that are out there. Um, and we were looking to license it. And in, in the process, we thought um, there's no sense in charging a handful of people that might find it uh, in a short period of time, um, although more found it than we thought. Um, so they're they're hungry for it. Um, and we have gotten a lot of emails since we announced that we're not doing updates to um, with people asking if they can buy the buy the picks. But that's not our business model. So uh, our. our our, we want to be a technology company. Um, I don't really want to be the online uh, wagering company. So we're, we're looking to move into other areas and move the tech rapidly between areas. So for us, our focus now is um, we really have three major areas we know we can make an impact right now. One is the financial markets. Um, it's very similar to the horse races in many ways. Um, you can think of the stocks as the horses, and then you can think of all the data and the they're racing against each other in, in their sectors, uh, and they're racing against the market as a whole, and you're influenced by things outside your control like news articles, and uh, that's another great example of just massive amounts of data that we think we can consume in a unique way. Um, other sports, obviously, um, down to the player level. So we think we'll be a good fit in fantasy games um, for fantasy sports because we'll be able to do a weekly um, forecast on individual players um, at a very good statistical analysis level. Um, and then, of course, um, in, in industries like healthcare, we, we know we can consume those, uh, those areas, uh, the data in those areas. But what's interesting is, the data is more accessible in the first two that I said than than the last one, right. um, which is an area from a passion of wanting to help people you want to get to. But when you as soon as you talk to somebody, you say, I need 15,000 cases. Um, they their eyes glaze over because most medical institutions don't have that kind of access even to their own data to say, I know I've got this many cases in this area with this kind of data set. So it gets more difficult as you get into areas that we'd all like to solve as, as people. Um, and it's funny, we, we collect more statistics on the things we do for fun, like sports um, and, of course, financial markets. Right. Yeah, it's uh, we saw that happen with uh, with IBM Watson. And again, with uh, I think they were training it to look for certain eye conditions and they they were able to get like a million patient records and i remember they got their hands on them and then someone sat up and said how'd you get those you're not a medical professional you're not a insurance company or something like that it's like you probably shouldn't even have access to a million people's private medical information and they're like yeah but we wanted it and they somehow <laughs> got it. It, it it's uh it's hard to get some of you know some of that data especially when it's very very uh personal to people so all right, so there's that. Let's talk about um, you know the you know the final race that you did. Obviously, it w uh, I'm not really into horse racing, but like I said, the uh, the Kentucky Derby. I mean, talk about what actually happened and uh, you know and your picks. And you know, were you at all discouraged? Because as I if I think I'm reading this right, uh, you said that um, how how can it be that your computed odds for the first place horse were different? They were close at one percent, but opposite order than your top exacta pick. Yeah, the AI surprises us sometimes and it gives you a lesson in statistics that you have to dig in and take a look at. So um, one of the things we've noticed with with the AI and the horse racing is 
it it frequently will say um, the especially in races where horses are close, it'll say if you're only going to bet on a winner, this is the horse you should bet on. Um, but if you're going to bet on the top two, the statistics change. And the reason is, um, and this is something I think a human expert would have a hard time even predicting that between the top two. The AI is probably noticing that when that horse um, doesn't doesn't win, um, that when the other horse coming in, uh, let me see, it's probably easier to describe with more horses than just sure. two. But like if a horse isn't going to win, it could be that it either wins or it loses. It doesn't come in second. Like it either sprints like crazy and it runs great or it doesn't. And the AI detects those trends and it's able to compute different statistical odds for different positions. And um, it's fascinating to us, the accuracy of some of those exacta and trifecta picks, it, it, because it's able able to look at those kind of mixes and go, yeah, you, th you would think looking at it that you should just pick the top three horses in the win category, but that's not actually the best pick. And if you run the data backwards, we're always surprised to find that the AI is computing it very well. And you go, wow, that actually is a, is a more accurate pick. So we had some people, the, the, the pick on the front was just too close. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, so, so the AI, we didn't recommend that you bet on the win, um, but the, the statistical odds on the exact combinations were pretty good for, for what's called an overlay in the bet, meaning the return on it. So, so we did, um, um, so, so we did actually, uh, recommend that pick. Right. No. And it, it's, uh, very, very interesting. And I guess just shows that, you know, it's, uh, like you said, it's all, uh, it's all statistics, not an exact science, but uh, very interesting either way. And I think we're going to wrap it up with, uh, you know, kind of talking about the future because uh, obviously, like you said, you're, you know, you're changing course. It's not just about horse racing anymore. And as you mentioned a bit earlier, that, you know, horse racing uh, for experts to kind of say who they think are going to win, it takes a lifetime of watching horse racing. It's steeped in tradition. It's steeped in, uh, you know, kind of biases and what people intuitively think rather than the data sets. And, you know, that's just horse racing. When you talk about football, my goodness, it's it doesn't matter if your team is the worst. If you're a Cubs fan, they were betting they were going to win the World Series for 100 years. And, <laughs> hey, you know, it only, I think it only took like 114 years for them to be right. Um, how, how receptive are people just in the sporting community going to be when it comes to, uh, you know, listening to an AI about, Hey, your team has a pretty slim chance, uh, better not put any money down on that. Yeah. I think you're touching on a really interesting area. Um, we, uh, uh, we, we did get some negative feedback on just having AI in this area at all. Um, I, I think if the picks are good, people will be receptive in time, but there's a lot of fear with AI today, um, that people have, um, they're, they're, they're afraid of people losing their jobs. And, um, I, I think in, in an area like this, they'll be saying, well, I can pick better than that. And I think that's just something you'll learn over time. Um, but, but I do, I do think that the, the lesson perhaps for us out of this first area was, uh, I do wonder how the reception might have been without the word AI on it right. um, <laughs> and whether people might have said, oh, these are some good new picks from a <laughs> new company. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, we, we, we were out to showcase the, the artificial intelligence, so I wouldn't redo it differently. But, but it is an interesting quandary for people using artificial intelligence in different areas. Um, that negativity, uh, we, we got some comments that were uh, – loud and clear. Um, and, then, and then I think what you touched on something else for sports betting that'll be important. There's a difference between fans and bettors. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and the, the serious bettors that fill up the pools, um, they're, they're, they're usually less fan oriented than the fans. Oh, okay. um, and, and I think one of the things that's going to make sports betting explode is the fans because they'll fill the pools up too. And it'll be a little different than horse racing in that. Right. No, and uh, and I, 
something that just kind of struck me is that, like you said, uh, many we take a lot more statistics for things that we enjoy rather than things that we kind of have to. And I remember, you know, sometimes watching, let's say, uh, you know, the college draft or watching, you know, the NFL, the NBA draft, what have you. They they have statistics that surprise me. It's like, yeah, he eats 38 Cheerios every morning. <laughs> and, 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 like, they pull out these statistics that are, like, crazy. And uh, let's face it. We're heading into the uh, the Internet of Things future, the thing where uh, training athletes is no longer, you know, kind of someone who makes you get up and push a tire around for three hours. It's it, it it's a science. It's a data driven experience uh -huh. to train an athlete. Um, what happens in the future when and I don't think I'm talking too crazy here. What happens when you have an entire high school athlete who is tracked from freshman to senior year? Uh, every you know, every workout session, every diet, you know, dietary input, every game, every you know, stat that could possibly be collected, and fed it through an AI, and then an AI, you know, that is run by, let's say, an organization such as a college, says that you know, based on the stats and based on our current lineup, uh, this is going to be our best pick. Like, do you see AI not just you know, kind of taking you know kind of a complementary role but even going a step further and becoming <sighs> something that is you know just so so vi you know so complex that we just kind of have to accept that well the ai says and you can't really you know you, you can't really say it's wrong because it's so it's so all-encompassing oh i think uh you're you're on to creative uses that are definitely coming. Um, and that one is a, is a really clear one. I think you'd even be able to predict out a lineup and how the team's going to do, uh, during the year, um, with a, with a new talent. Um, and you're, you're right. I don't know how, you, how it's, it's going to be a new tool that coaches and, and, uh, the, um, management of, of teams have to use and the ones that don't, um, and, and I think there's been some, there's a movie about something like this with the use of statistics, I think in baseball mm -hmm. and, and how it changed the game. Um, the ones that don't will be left behind because, um, you, the human mind can't put this much data into it and come up with clear cut, clear path, um, predictions and solutions. Um, and the AI can, um, I, I don't think it replaces needing a coach. Right. Um, there's still a human element and motivation and everything else. Um, it's just another tool uh, that that we'll be using. Um, and but but that is interesting, and it's got implications in in a lot of different areas. It, I, I'm I'm excited because again, these are all things that hey, if I could think of it, uh, I'm sure there are people such as yourself and a lot of other people out there that are going. Yeah, we could do that, and they're working on it actively. So, hey, it's uh, it's all an exciting field, and that's why I said way at the beginning I was excited to talk about this with you because uh, this is a field that only has a long, long way to develop and grow. And hey, this was a very interesting conversation. So, uh, Tim, thank you so much for your extra time, and thank you for coming on the show. If people want to find out more, uh, when can they start expecting updates again? As you mentioned, uh, no more updates on the AI horse racing. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave you with a final message. Yeah, uh, they certainly can check uh, AICertain.com, um, and we'll be posting other areas we'll be getting into uh, there. And thanks again for uh, l uh, having us on your show. We appreciate it. Oh, our pleasure, our pleasure. And Tim, until next time, uh, thank you so much. So have a great day, and uh, yeah, catch you next time. Okay, thanks. All right, bye-bye. All right, everyone. So there he goes, and that is once again Tim Kenny. He is the uh, he is the CEO for AI Certain, and a lot of different uh, hey, you know, a lot of different use cases for artificial intelligence. And I think that was a lot of fun to uh, to talk about. Never never a dull moment when you talk about artificial intelligence. But in the meantime, we are going to go ahead and jump into computer and technology news. And, you know, this is a segment dedicated to everything new, news related, things like that. Uh, if you, hey, you know, if you want to come to the chat room and mention some stories that we could definitely check out, feel free to. And, uh, and yeah, you know, we'll look into it. But in the meantime, computer and technology news brought to you by OWC. <laughs>
All right. So a lot of uh, a lot of very interesting and newsworthy news stories that we have here. And I think we're going to start with the net neutrality and then work our way into the more important topics. So only about 10 minutes here, only going to be able to get to a couple. But if you want to find out more, head on over to our website, computeramerica.com. Now, here we go. Let's get into net neutrality. There was a vote. Uh, let's see, how far back should I take this? Net neutrality, if you are an active internet user that goes to a lot of different publications, you probably have heard the term net neutrality before, especially if you've listened to the show. It's the idea that regardless of where the data originates from, what packet you are trying to convey, no data is more important than anyone else's data. It's neutral, it's a neutral playing field, and the internet is not simply a, or I'm sorry, the internet is not up for fast lanes or slow lanes. It is simply a constant stream of data that propagates as it will. That's the idea of net neutrality. And you can't segregate or block or discriminate against anyone else's data. So what this means on a consumer level is that uh, let's say your provider, uh, you know, enter any of the big providers out there for internet, they couldn't go behind the scenes, they could not make a deal with uh, any content provider, be that Hulu or Netflix or, you know, some other, let's say, streaming service, and they wouldn't prefer one service over the other. You, you know, just because, let's say, again, completely fictitious, uh, just because you're a Comcast subscriber does not mean that you get a better experience through Hulu than you would Netflix because Hulu made a deal with Comcast or because they're owned by the same company. Things like that. Net neutrality, even playing field. And the opposite side of the argument is the fact that because you can't discriminate against data, uh, opponents of net neutrality claim that a lot of data gets through that should be prioritized, be that through healthcare, be that through, um, you know, things that people actually prefer. Like, why does your data from, uh, you know, from your internet connected toaster have the same priority as, um, you know, say as your pacemaker data to your doctor over the internet? Things like that. Why, you know, why is that the case? And wouldn't the internet be a better place if we could discriminate like that? And trust me, we've been over all the different arguments. Uh, we have, I think we even have an episode of Computer America about a year back that is concerned everything with net neutrality. So feel free to check that out. And hey, uh, feel free to send us questions uh, if you are at all uh, confused. But here's today's news. The Senate has voted and as we said earlier in the show has approved the bill to retain u.s net neutrality so before this the federal communications commission which is the over which makes the the regulations behind uh net neutrality and the internet they voted i think it was like three to two to repeal net neutrality that's right not elected officials voted to repeal something that affects every single person out there. And so those were to go into effect June June 11th, I believe, was when net neutrality was to be repealed. But it's been raised in the Senate and with a margin, I believe 52 to 47, they have voted to, well, talk about it at least. And that's a start. They said that the margin was larger than expected, with three Republicans voting with 47 Democrats and two independents to reverse Trump administration action. So Trump administration referring to Ajit Pai, FCC, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so it's not clear if the U.S. House of Representatives will vote at all on the measure, while the White House has said it opposed repealing the December FCC order. So the White House opposes repealing it. So the FCC is for the repeal of net neutrality. So again, checks and balances, the way the U.S. government works, uh, this is far from over, 
but at the same time, it shows that something is being done on the side of keeping net neutrality. There you go. And let's see. So, uh, you know, they have a couple of comments here saying, you know, let's treat the internet like the public good that it is, blah, blah, blah. And let's see. So let's get to the uh, point here. Let's see. The revised rules were a win for internet. Let's see. No, that's talking about net neutrality, what it was uh, when it was uh, put into place by Obama. Uh, AT&T said Wednesday that it backs an open internet and actual bipartisan, bipartisan legislation that applies to all internet companies and guarantees net neutrality, uh, transparency, openness, non-discrimination, and privacy protections for all users. AT&T, by the way, if you're wondering who kind of supports repealing net neutrality, it's not really a black and white issue. It's not really a, you know, uh, some voters and other voters. It's pretty strictly uh, people who, it's consumers versus large telecommunication industry insiders. Like, that's another reason that this gets so much appeal is that net neutrality is supported by a large majority of con of consumers and voters out there. Whereas repealing it is widely supported by telecommunication and other businesses. So, yep, uh, they voted to hear on it and it still has to go through the House, it still has to be signed by the White House, and legislation itself still has to be written. But, uh, but yeah, there you go. Uh, it's a small win, let's put it that way. A small win for net neutrality. Happy to hear it. So... Let's see, let's go ahead and talk about this one. So only like one more story left and I really want to, want to get to this one because I'm on a new diet. It's uh, intermittent fasting, so I can't eat for a while. And I thought, what better way to really make sure I put myself through the most pain than to cover this story from Motherboard. And yeah, it's... um. Here's a video, and they're showing how to make an edible drone made out of pizza. So it's called Dead Drones, D-E Drones, and they crafted a flyable edible, edible quadcopter from pizza crust. And if you're watching the video portion, you can see it there. But uh, let's see. All right, so... Uh, let's see. So the pilot, this drone made out of pizza directly into the author's mouth. This is coming from motherboard again. And of course it starts out when the moon hits your eyes, like a big pizza pie, that's a quadcopter. Uh, YouTubers, the drones who previously raced drones through abandoned ships and ghost drones embarked on a cheesy challenge with their latest video. And they dubbed the L drone pizza. The frame of the quadcopter is built out of homemade crust, complete with pepperoni and green pepper toppings. And yeah, so it even shows them outside with the actual pizza. And yeah, they're flying it. Uh, El Drone Pizza cruises through the air just fine, but loses a lot of its cheese and toppings on takeoff. And when the pilot tries to do a barrel roll, the pizza can't handle it. It breaks apart and eats dirt, where probably for the best, you don't really want to eat a pizza that's been whipping through a field. Think a lot of bugs and a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of grossness. So drone hobbyists, they said, uh, so they, they did blog it and they did tell you what the ingredients are, the baking temperatures. And if you want to bake your own edible drone, yeah, you now have the recipe. But it's pretty darn cool. So uh, the article wraps up by saying, or you can keep holding out for hope that Domino's uh, to get its stuff together and start delivering pizza by drone. So there you have it. Poor little pizza drone. And uh, until next time, everyone, the music means that we are just about done here. Thank you so much for checking us out here at Computer America. Again, this is, uh, you can listen to us live on IRN wherever you may be but you can also watch the video which is just hey the video companion to our live radio show everyone have a great day thank you so much for tuning in and be sure to check us out tomorrow 4 p.m to 5 p.m eastern 
here on the program as we talk with the one, the only, Mr. Marcel Gagné. And he is our Linux correspondent. It's our all-Linux show. And if you've been curious at all about Linux, if you are Linux curious, hey, this is the show for you. So until tomorrow, have a great day. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, be sure to catch us here. Uh, and by the way, be sure if you miss any part of today's show, check us out in podcast form. Folks, have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.